What's going on Port fans? Welcome back to another video on my channel and today we're going to be reviewing round 13. Port Adelaide vs Geelong happened on Thursday night. A disappointing 21 point loss and it seems to be a bit of the old copy and paste when it comes to be playing at the top four or the top eight sides. Every single time we seem to be in the game, in the contest and then unfortunately just our own selves cost us a chance at getting the big fat dub. But unfortunately, here I am once again talking to you guys about a loss against the top eight side. And well, we're all feeling pretty much the same, aren't we? So let's review the game and see what positives we can pull out from what was a pretty uh, interesting performance. I've actually done research for this review. Can you believe it? Normally, I just go based on feeling and what I saw and, um, you know, try to, you know, create a a mindset where we can go into next week thinking about that and you know this is all therapy for me really talking about the game for 10 to 15 minutes with you guys and um, first of all just want to say seeing everyone's comments and everyone reaching out and um, stuff like that's been really good and really good to see the feedback that we um, uh, us as a fan base are giving both on all social medias um, and also you know with each other and in person and it was a very different feeling in the crowd last night once Geelong started to get on top in certain times of the game um, and it was great to you know it's good that we're having this feedback of you know we're actually getting, giving it pretty constructively compared to la the previous years where we've actually just um, you know gone straight for well straight for the negatives and all that and there's a few people that I've seen around on the socials that have been quite positive and saying we're almost there, we're almost there. And I agree, we're almost there. You know, Ken Inkley keeps saying we're good, but we're not good enough. I've titled this not good enough. And that's the way that I'm feeling at the moment. And a lot of people, I think, will be quite... You know, a lot of us are angry and frustrated while we can't just quite get that extra 5%. And that extra 5% will win us the game. We're three goals behind Geelong. We're three goals behind the Bulldogs, you know, um, Brisbane was a blowout, West Coast were about six goals off, but it wasn't a good start, but, and then obviously beating Richmond, for me, it's not all that doom and gloom, but at the same time, you can write us off as contenders for now, and what I'm basing this on is, is the present moment, in the scheme of things, we're just not good enough to be a contender, we're filling in the eight, and we're going to fill in the eight, performing like this for the rest of the year. If we don't find something else. So it's me at the moment stating that at the, this current stage we're not contenders. And a lot of people will say that. And unfortunately we believe that we are. We believe that we're better than what we're putting out against these better sides. But it's just not good enough to be considered contenders. And until then we're going to be called flat track bullies. We're going to be called, you know, not uh, pretenders. We're going to be called all these different other titles that have come across from media and other supporters but at the, I don't care what they say. I want to hear what we're saying. And at the moment, I'm believing everything that's been said. But we've walked into this game. Had Tom Jonas come out and state the goal's top four. And we're going to want to play our best footy. We played our best footy in patches last night. The best footy that I saw was the first half um, on the attack. Defensively, we were no good. Throughout the whole night, there was too many holes in our defence. And that's rare because normally our defensive unit is one of the best in the business and we hold pretty strong and other areas of our ground fail. Delivery inside 50. Once again, where's Charlie? Hit Charlie. Nothing else. Unfortunately, Marshall going down hurt that and Charlie had to take pretty much Marshall's opponent and we had no answer for that. And a ball movement, unless it was you know, from the stoppages and from the clearances, Going inside 50, that first half was great because even though Marshall was out, we were finding ways to score goals from stoppages and uh, it was a, it was the Port Adelaide that we knew would beat the bigger teams and the better teams is because we score goals from stoppages. You know, We had Wines kicking goals. Rosie kicked four in the first quarter. Pow Pepper uh, and Charlie ended up with four and that was on the back of a different mindset going into the last quarter. But it was just... There's stats that I've written down here and I'll go through. There's like the stoppage factor that I'll talk about. So hit outs, broke even, 36 apiece. I thought Laddams was really good in the ruck. He really took it to Radagalia um, and Blitzarves, who was in there. And I think that was the one thing I wanted, was him to break even in that. He's not the greatest of tap ruckmen, but he does do really well at his feet and really helps out around the ground. And he broke even last night, which was really good to see. Uh, our midfield was on, I thought. I thought they 
well, Drew's defensive work in the midfield was exceptional. 10 tackles. Um, and he was really, really good against the bigger bodies in there. So credit to him. Boke and Wines do their job every single week. Boke was being tagged. He had eight disposals at halftime. I turned to my mate who I brought with me. I said, Boke will get over 25 touches by the end of this game. He's a second half specialist. He breaks the tags even though they put a hard one on him. O'Connor was on him, doing a fairly good job. Boke ended up with 27. Because he's a gun. He's untaggable, that man. So there's a positive for you. Along with him and Ollie Wines... They stood up in the middle when Robbie Gray was there or thereabouts, but wasn't as classy as what you'd like. He was making a lot of mistakes, and he's he was quite he's fairly beaten last night, Robbie, and that was a a little bit of a concern down forward uh, in the midfield. I think he just wasn't quite a hundred percent, which was unfortunate for him. But Robbie has those games, and you know when it's not your night, it's not your night. Um, so thirty eight apiece in the clearances, which was really good in total. Out of those clearances, the centre clearances, there was obviously 30 goals scored for the night. So, th- um, so 30 out of the 30 total centre clearances, we won them, 16 and 14. So that's a very good positive for me is the midfield was able to switch on. And yes, it was too easy defensively, but atta- on the attack is the one thing we've struggled in. And we're able to do so and we let it quarter time, which is good to see our starts have been fixed. I sent out a tweet and said, oh, good to see Port Adelaide's first quarters are back to normal, and then next minute we kick four goals in five minutes. So yeah, that answered my question. Out of the stoppages, we did lose the stoppage clearances, 22 to 24, um, and around the ground we were beaten fairly convincingly in the contest. Um, they were, I think, plus 20 or something in contested possessions, and um, when we did win the contest, that we just the bodies were just too strong. Our tackling was really good. It was 65 to 37 in tackles, so. They were just better around the ground, um, more effective inside 50s um, in terms of marking. You know, they had 18 inside 50 marks compared to us, 9, which shows how much when we go inside 50 or how much we're going down the ground that we're bombing it to Charlie or the tallest option there. And it was such a shame. Charlie took so many damn good marks across the night. And he was, he, he was as influential as anyone, one of the best for us on the night, but... You can't keep doing that, and we've been saying it for so long now. You can't go to Charlie all the time. It, I, do, I know he's the big enforcer, and that's the first instinct you have when you have the footy and you're on the run. But it's just not effective. It's just not effective, and it's frustrating to see this continually happen. And I hate blaming coaches, and I hate blaming... You know, it's all The players are making the decisions in the end. On the field, so you you put that on the the onus on the players to make that decision, but the structure's not there. It's just not there. And when you lose one like Todd Marshall, and Toddy's a structural player, and I've said this from the outset. Yes, he can play poorly. Yes, he can not influence the contest at all. But he's a structure player, and whoever's playing that position has a massive role to play in helping out Charlie Dixon. If Charlie's kicking four goals like he did last night, and Todd Marshall is there then we're kicking another four or five goals on the back of the fact that we're not always bombing it to Charlie because we've got another contest there and the smalls will pick up. That's when your Motlops, your Rosies, you know, your Woodcocks, who's, by the way, can't even get into the game. It was a med sub and he played pretty much the whole game and he did bugger all. Kane Farrell had five possessions for the night, kicked one of the best goals I've seen and the flukiest goals, I should say. It's too many passengers. You know, one week someone will stand up. Like this week it was Connor Rosie. To see four goals kicked in the first quarter by Connor, I was genuinely happy for Connor Rosie. He's been struggling out there, and I think it's because Aratio's come in now. Now the fact that Aratio went out and we haven't seen the best of Connor Rosie, it was great to see him play that half forward role we know he can. That quick clearance. And that's what happens when you win the center clearances. You give him the first option, he can clean up around that contest, and he's so silky smooth. And you just saw him last night. He's dancing and weaving, and he, he's got a great kick on him. He's smart. And when he's hitting the goals, that's it just brings to life everyone else. And it was so good to see that we had that momentum for the first half. And then we got to that last 10 minutes in the second quarter, and the whole game turned on us. The third quarter was ugly. We probably would deserve to be more down in the by the end of by three-quarter time. And... The last quarter came out, we kicked first three goals in five minutes, and I'm thinking, holy hell, we're in for a contest now. This is going to go down to the wire. And then Geelong kicked five or six in a row. Like it's just, and the, the, like the defensive unit was... I had his worst game, 
for us. Still did some good things, but we had his worst game. Too many drop marks out of defensive 50 for all of our defensive. Burton's lost his good form from the first five rounds. DBJ is one that has to stand up. He's a leader of the club, and there was one instance in that last quarter where Parfit had a shot on goal. He was all by himself, and DBJ was all by himself 10 metres off of him. I understand he's a leader. I know why he's a leader. He's a very good footballer, and he won the John Cowell medal last year for a reason. But that is one of the worst turnarounds for a BNF winning season I've seen. And it's disappointing because we know how good he is. And his, his run and carry is very important. But he's just not on at the moment. And I talk about big bodies. Like we've got such small bodies around the ground. we lost the contest because we're not hard enough at it. But they were just too big. Their intercept marking on from their wingman was exceptional because they had bigger bodies. Isaac Smith has a big body. Menegola has a big body. We, don't, we have teeny tiny wingmen. Poor Carl Amon's playing in the midfield. Couldn't get the ball. He's silky smooth with his legs. But he just couldn't get the ball because he's not as big. He's a very good wingman, Carl Amon. And I'm not blaming him for his game. He's very good. Um, but it's just... The point is, they're a big body. I don't understand why we're not playing the likes of Hamish Hartlett. You know, Lockie Jones needed to get more in the game. It was good to see him play forward in the last quarter. Kick his first goal... For uh for his career and that was sensational. I like that move. I like that Ken was trying to risk something and try and get something going, but the last quarter was on the players. I think because we, we opened up our structure up forward was pretty good actually. You know Charlie Dixon kicked two goals from leading up and marking and Connor Rosie was in it again because we had a different structure up forward and that was very good to see. Um, the, for the first three quarters a bit different, and that was probably that third quarter and. I think more so was the fact that we just didn't get any inside 50 enough. We had 45 for the night. 45 inside 50s for the night. We had pretty good percentage when we went in there. 14 goal 7, our goal kicking. So we didn't waste too many opportunities. It was actually pretty good goal kicking from us, and it has been for quite a while. But when you get to the point of not getting it inside 50 enough, why? Why is that the case? Well, it's turnovers up the ground. Too many of this slow switch kick play that we have. I don't know why we do it. We've been doing it forever, and when we do it, we do it right and we do it quick. And I like, we used to do it a lot last year, and we used to cut back inside and use the corridor a lot more. We don't, we hardly use the corridor. And when we do use the corridor, we over handball. And it's just that inside 50 kick from that becomes so much more open space when we use the corridor, we use the quick switch. Alir last night, perfect example in the third quarter, we switched the play. He took the mark. It was just a mark before one of the Geelong opponents were about to come in the spool. He played on and then gets run down. He had four players free. You go as soon as you get the chance to kick it. We had one, two, three, bang, bang. We're inside 50. Having a shot on goal because we had options and the space inside 50. But instead, you take that one extra step. We're too slow for our decision making on that switch. And that's what happens. We cost a goal. It's just not effective enough. 65 to 55 turnovers. I think it was 75% efficiency to 72% um, for disposable efficiency throughout the night. Our turnovers were shocking. And when we did turn it over, this is the critical part. When we turned it over, it was in the critical parts of the ground. It wasn't just that long ball going inside 50 and they intercept Mark or um, you know, it was a gamble to the wrong opponent or it was just a shocking kick. And that, that stuff happens. Those turnovers happen. Turnover's part of the AFL game. But it's the decision-making to get to that turnover is the reason why Port Adelaide lost the game last night. That switch kick long into the middle of the ground, it's kicking it to Bonner, or Bonner kicking it. Yeah, you, you're hitting a target. You're supposed to hit a target on that switch kick, and that's what I'm saying. We're too slow with it. We're too slow switching that kick. And it's unfortunate. Because that's what's making the difference between us being the top four side that we know we can be and why we're dwindling in the middle part of the eight. I could ramble on forever. There's one more thing I want to talk about. I've always said, and I've noticed this for the last couple of years now, uh, probably not as much last year because of the shortened quarters, but when Port Adelaide is on, a lot of the players get the ball. When our players get the ball, there's not too many. I'm talking maybe one, if we're lucky, one player, or not even, will get, over 10, uh, will get less than 10 touches for a game. When we're on, everyone's touching the footy, everyone's getting at least 10 touches or more, and we're contributing equally and actually playing a good game of football. Last night, a third of our team, a third, 
had 10 touches or less. That's just not on. You know, and I could list these players. You know, I think uh, Georgiatis, Farrell, Motlop, Jonas. Jonas normally when he's touching the footy, it's so much better. Jonas was probably the best defender out of um, the lot last night, I thought. Uh, Mackenzie was just dominated. I don't know why. It was lucky last year in the qualifying final when he was playing on Hawkins that he didn't didn't get dominated more. Um, but that Hawkins missed all those goals. Um, we missed Cleary last night. Cleary's a lot more better. He's, he's a very good kick on both sides. He's quicker with the footy too when he's switching. Um, Burton didn't have a lot of the footy. Um, you know, and it's just these types of players that are passengers. Passengers at the side. Motlop had probably his worst game for the year last night. I've said his run and carry is so important and he's been really good and um, working his ass off to get to the footy. But too many of these players are not doing enough. And Motlop and Bonner were the two keys I wanted to look at because they're fringe players and we pick on these fringe players because they're passengers. And obviously we know who stood up last night. I'll give you my best. We had Boak, or we had Wines, we had Boak, we had Rosie, we had Dixon. Um, you know, and these players were very, very good. It's those same players every single week. And then we have the passengers. One, two, three, four, maybe we'll stand up and the others will do their part and play their role and that's how we like it. But last night, third of the team didn't have 10 touches. Bonner and Motlop had zero tackles for the night. Bonner is piss weak when it comes to defensive pressure. I don't, he's not, that's not his role. He's obviously got a silky kick. He's got pace, which I haven't seen a lot of. He's a very good out uh, scapegoat for getting the footy out of the defensive 50 and running and carrying the ball. That's his role. But when it comes to your turn to be defensive-minded and you have the pressure, or you're playing one-on-one, -on -one, you need to get a fist in or create a contest, that's your role as well. You don't have to be the big body, but you put the pressure on. There was no... T I don't think Bonner's had a tackle for a month. And you throw him out, you throw in someone like a Hamish Hartlett, Hamish Hartlett will get you those four or five tackles. He might only have 10 to 15 touches. He might do the same amount of disposal efficiency, but he's getting those four or five extra tackles, and they're up the ground too. They're cutting off what's coming inside 50. That's the difference. I know Hamish Hartlett's out of form, and he's playing in the SNFL, and I'll be very interested to see how he goes in the Magpies this weekend, and I hope he plays really well because that's his spot. Bring our vice-captain back in. Bring back a leader, not Bonner, and maybe even drop Motlop because at the moment... These are the types of players that need to stand up in these situations. And so many people have been talking about passengers. They're it at the moment. And I'm not saying Motlop and Farrell and Bonner and these players always have to be dropped. DBJ is maybe another one that has to be thrown up in the air. Make a statement with selection. Because these types of players, you can't carry them all year. Because if you keep carrying these players, you're not going to get a premiership. You'd be lucky to win a final. So there's so much to think about coming out of this game. This is why this game was so important because it was going to pull apart everything that we, us fans, have looked at and wanted and we didn't quite get it. If we won last night, yeah, we probably wouldn't be raising these points as much and we'd go into Gold Coast next week feeling great. We're finally beating a top eight side, top four side, and we're happy. But it's these moments when you lose by three goals and I understand we've got so many people out you know, you've got your Cleary out, massive out for the back line. Butters, Dersma, Fantasia, there's th there's three to five goals right there. Lysette in the ruck. He comes straight back in next week, which means Laddams will be the second fiddle, which means Todd Marshall, unfortunately, misses next week with this concussion test. So there's your straight swap. There's already a change. Perfect. And unfortunate for Toddy because I reckon he, you know, yeah, look, I was harsh on Toddy, but he probably deserved to keep playing, and he would have been a massive part of last night, probably would have contributed as more, as I said before. But that's that's next week. So that's that's what I've been thinking about. That's everything. And I know it's a rant, and it's not going to be a lot of editing to this video because it's just me rambling on from the stats that I've looked at, from the key pillars of the night, and the people that need to stand up. And I'm, it's unfortunate. And to wrap it all up, it's unfortunate that we keep losing to the top four sides. You know, but the dogs, the lions... And um, now Geelong and West Coast hanging about in the eight as well. I know that was early, that was round three, so you're not going to really base that. And we beat Richmond, who are still the pillar to beat the most. And I think if you knock them off, you're in pretty good stead. So I reckon, yeah, I'm taking a breath. I'm relaxing. 
going to move on, move forward. I'm not going to think about it this long weekend. We're going to come back next week and we're going to really dive in and hopefully it's not. It's, it's unfortunate that we get to play the Gold Coast at MatchCon, who won't be an easy beat, but it's we know that we'll probably bounce back. We've bounced back well this year against the, the next week and then we got to wait till probably Sydney the week after to really ha test us again against the top eight side. And they're not the big bull top eight side that we've been you know, wanting to beat, but it's got to be another statement, and it's at home. So that's your next two weeks. So I put the call out to, to the coaching panel, to um, everyone involved in the football department, that now this is the time. Yep, we've lost to Geelong. Accept it. we all got to accept it. There's still 10 rounds to go. Qualify for finals, and anything can happen from there. That's the outlook we've got to have. And unfortunately, at the moment, we're going to have to dwell for another eight days before round 14. Longer review than normal. I know. I've rambled on. I've got everything. This is, like I said before, this is like therapy for me. I get everything out. Hopefully, you guys agree. And if you don't, I completely understand. Look, it's just a round review. We can move on to next week. I'm still optimistic, but it's very hard not to be uh, disappointed and angry and frustrated because that's part of being a fan. So... Let me know in the comments below what you thought about the game, who was your best, and I look forward to seeing all of those because I know there's going to be a fair few comments coming through for this one. So make sure you subscribe to the channel if you're new for plenty more Port Adelaide and AFL content coming your way as well. I'll put out the vlog tomorrow so we can all, uh, if you didn't go to the game, which was 28,000 by the way, so Thursday night footing off for Port Adelaide, but that's another story for another time. So uh, hopefully you enjoy that one tomorrow and have a good long weekend and I'll see you in the next video. My name is Anthony, and as always, count the pair.